James says this, he said, What is your life? It is even a vapor Amen. that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. It's how short our lives they are, our folks, here on, on, on this earth and in this time. We have a very short time in this earth. Our lives are very short. My grandmother, she passed away just a few years ago there in uh, December of 2017. And my grandmother, when she was laying upon her deathbed, she said, life is the shortest journey that you will ever take. Now I'm sure when she was a young lady, she thought she had all the time in the world a lot of days ahead of her. She thought that the end would never come, like most young folks today, they think they're invincible. And they think that the end will never come. They refuse to think about death. They put those things out of their mind because that time will never come. But my grandmother at the end of her life, she said that life is the shortest journey that you will ever take. And certainly when you're laying there on your deathbed and you're getting ready to close your eyes for the last time, you look back and your life was just a fleeting moment. Many of y'all are parents. You know this is the way life works. You know that your children were just toddlers and babes, what seemed like yesterday. But some of them have now grown and they left the nest. How quickly time flies. How quickly 25 years goes by and you look back and you go, wow. If I live to be 90 years old, I've already lived half my life. Time goes by so quickly, folks. And most don't count the cost of eternity. They only think about the present time, the present age, and do what's pleasurable unto them for a season. So you must become a fool that you may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. I've met many atheists out on the street. And even many Christians are professing Christians that have a worldly wisdom about them. And they think they're so wise that they know so much. I've met many folks that profess themselves to be Christians, but they smoke marijuana. That's why I'm bringing these verses up tonight, folks because marijuana is defiling that temple of your body. And God says he will destroy you if you defile that temple. You can't be a Christian and get high. You can't be a Christian and get drunk. That's not a Christian, that's called a hypocrite. First John chapter three says, he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. It's for this reason or for this cause that the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That he that has been born of God committeth not sin. For his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. That's the Christian folks. He doesn't go on living a life of sin. He doesn't get drunk and say, I'm a Christian. He doesn't smoke cigarettes and say, I'm a believer in God because he knows that's defiling his temple as it says in 1 Corinthians 3 and we know that God will destroy any man that defiles the temple where the Holy Ghost dwells call upon his name while you he is found call ye upon him while you he is near let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous men his thoughts let him return into the Lord for he will have mercy upon you. He will have mercy upon you, my friends. But you must deny yourselves. Become the cross of Christ. What I have led for you. Pick it up, my friend. 
pick it up and be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. He has mercy for you, my friends. Good by Jesus Christ. You can be redeemed to die. Yes. Jesus Christ can save you. He can save you, my friends. Do not lay back in your couch. Claiming to be Christians, but your sense defiles you. Your sense shows who you are. You're lost in your sin. You are lost in your sin, my friend. Come to Christ. Come to Christ. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You can be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Wash you, my friend. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Says the Lord. Bible says in 1 Corinthians, 1 John 2.15, rather the Bible says in 1 John 2.15, to love not the things that are in the world, neither the things that are of the world. The Bible says, if any man loveth the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. These are not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever, folks. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You know, that reminds me of this passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 7. As Jesus was given his sermon upon the mount, and Jesus spoke about those false prophets and false believers, those that would profess him with their mouth and honor them with his lips, but their heart was far from them, folks. Jesus spoke of them as this and said, Jesus said, not everyone that doeth not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. He said on that day, many will cry unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not done many great things in thy name? Have we not cast out devils in thy name? Have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name done many wonderful works? And Jesus said this, and he said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that worketh iniquity. Why is it that Jesus told these folks that we're doing all these good works and all these good deeds? He's not denying the fact that they prophesied in his name. Jesus is not denying the fact that they cast out devils in his name or done many wonderful and mighty works in his name. But what Jesus said is, depart from me, ye that work in iniquity. Folks, you can do all kinds of mighty things for God and not depart from iniquity. But someone that is truly born again, someone that has new life in them, is truly a new creature, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians or brother 2 Corinthians 5 17 he says if any man is in Christ he's a new creature he said old things have passed away behold all things have become new all things have become new that old man has passed away Paul said this in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 he said I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me in this life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's called being born again. You've been crucified with Christ. That old man, that old flesh, that sinful flesh has been crucified with him, laid in the grave, and resurrected unto new life through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, folks. 
you can be a new creature in him. You know, Jesus said it. He said, I make all things new. All things. That old sinful man. Folks, I'm telling you, if you're a drunkard, if you're a thief or a fornicator, a homosexual, whatever kind of sin you're engaged in, folks, uh, Jesus Christ, he can make you new. He can make you a new creature. He made me a new creature. I used to be a drunkard, fornicator, pot smoker, a liar, a thief, you name it, folks. I was a wicked devil, deserving of a devil's hell. But Jesus Christ, he set me free. He redeemed me. He purged me of my iniquity. And he made all things new. He made me a new creature in him. And he can do the same for you tonight, folks. So I said, the Bible says, to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And there's a lot of folks tonight in this day and age and time that love the world and they love the things of the world. And he said this, he said, if any man loveth the world, the love of the Father is not in him. James put it another way, James 4.4, 4, he said, Yo, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity against God. He said, therefore, if you're a friend of the world, you are an enemy of God. I don't know about you folks, but I've been a lot of I've been an enemy to a lot of folks in this world and in this life, but I don't want to be an enemy of God. I don't want to be counted among one of God's enemies. I know what happens to the enemies of God. They lose at the end. But you know, God is gracious and he's merciful. He's long suffering towards us. He's slow to anger. He's slow to wrath. Second Peter three, nine says this, says God is not slack concerning promises as some men count slackness but is long suffering that means God is patient he's long suffering not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance folks in, in not so many words what that means is God doesn't want you to go to hell God doesn't want you to perish he wants you to come to repentance and while you're living in your sin he's very patient and he's long suffering with you that's the grace of God that's the mercy of God that he would abide and stand by while you're living in your sin and not just strike you down. That's God's grace, folks. God is a, a merciful God. God bless you, sir. God is very merciful. And he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. My friend, he wants to give you life tonight. He wants to give you life through his son. God is not willing that any should perish, not one. That's the will of God. But that all should come to repentance. You know, he's paid a cost. He paid the greatest of costs so that you could be reconciled unto him and that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's the price that God the Father paid in giving his only begotten son so that you would not perish, that you would not go to hell, but you, you would have everlasting life through his son Jesus. It says there in John 3, 17, that God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God doesn't want you to be condemned. He wants you to be saved. And that's why he sent his son into this world. Now, unfortunately, many are condemned already. We go on and read that in the next verse, John 3, 18. It says, he that believeth in him is not condemned. He that believeth in who? He that believeth in Jesus is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So we see Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but there are many, if not most, that are condemned already. Not by Jesus, but they're condemned by their own sin, their own rejection of the gospel, 
their rejection of the Son of God who died upon a cross, a bloody death, so that you can be reconciled unto the Father. And he didn't stop it there. He sent out his messengers, his servants, to preach this gospel of reconciliation to you that you might be saved, friends, so that you could have eternal life through his Son. He says, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light. That's the very condemnation. The very condemnation, folks, is that light is coming to the world. Jesus, light into this dark world. And men love sin or love their darkness rather than the light. You know, I think about many different sins. There's lots of different sins. I spoke there about 1 John 2.15. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loveth the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life are not of the Father, but they're of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I want to focus in there on what the, the love of the world is. He said, the lust of the eyes. What is the lust of the eyes, folks? That is covetousness. To covet after things with your eyes that don't belong to you. It could be your neighbor's wife. It could be one of your neighbor's cars. That you covet this and you're envious of him. Because he has something that you don't. Which leads some people to steal. It leads some people to commit adultery. These things that don't belong to them. The lust of the eyes. The lust of the, the flesh. And what is the lust of the flesh? The things that make the flesh feel good. It could be drunkenness. It could be getting high. It could be committing adultery. That lust of the flesh. Are you, are you, you're not engaged in that lust of the flesh, are you? Not smoking no weed, I hope. That is the lust of the flesh. The Bible says that no sorcerer will inherit the kingdom of God. There in Revelation 21, 8. said the sorcerers will have their part in lake of fire, which is the second death. The lake of fire. Sorcerers. That, that word in Koine Greek is pharmakia, which means things that get you high. And, and potions, weed, drugs. That's where we get the word pharmaceutical. The lust of the flesh. Doing those things that make you feel good. That's what sin does, doesn't it? I know I used to be a filthy, wicked sinner. And the reason I sinned was because it felt good. The Bible says itself. The Bible says that the pleasures of sin, our sin is pleasurable for a season. We don't deny that, that sin is pleasurable for a season. But in the end, it leads to death. I want to ask you, friend, is it worth it to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season? Is it worth it to go out and get high? To go out and get drunk? So that you can feel good for a season and spend eternity in hell? Is it worth it, folks? Jesus says this, he said, What good is a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Many of y'all have gave something in exchange for your soul already. Many of y'all would rather engage in the pleasures of sin for a season than to receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ through faith. And to be obedient and walk in obedience to Him. Why is that? Why would you reject such a beautiful gift. Now I'm sure if any of you, if you were offered with a new house at no cost to you, oh, God bless you. Not too many folks today would reject a free gift of a, a new house or a new automobile. Something that you would definitely get something out of in this life. But many of y'all will reject an eternal gift that carries on life throughout eternity. You would refuse it for the pleasures of sin in this life. Many of y'all would rather be in drunkenness or getting high.
committing fornication, having sex outside of marriage, than to receive a free gift of salvation through, the Jesus, through Jesus Christ. As Jesus said there, what would a man give in exchange for a soul? I want you to stop and think what you would give in exchange for your soul. What kind of sin are you engaged in tonight? Because obviously you hold that sin more valuable than your own soul. James says this, he said, What is your life? It is even a vapor Amen. that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. It's how short our lives they are, our folks, here on, on, on this earth and in this time. We have a very short time in this earth. Our lives are very short. My grandmother, she passed away just a few years ago there in uh, December of 2017. And my grandmother, when she was laying upon her deathbed, she said, life is the shortest journey that you will ever take. Now I'm sure when she was a young lady, she thought she had all the time in the world. A lot of days ahead of her. She thought that the end would never come. Like most young folks today, they think they're invincible. And they think that the end will never come. They refuse to think about death. They put those things out of their mind because that time will never come. But my grandmother at the end of her life, she said that life is the shortest journey that you will ever take. And certainly when you're laying there on your deathbed and you're getting ready to close your eyes for the last time, you look back and your life was just a fleeting moment. Many of y'all are parents. You know this is the way life works. You know that your children were just toddlers and babes, what seemed like yesterday. But some of them have now grown and they left the nest. How quickly time flies. How quickly 25 years goes by and you look back and you go, wow. If I live to be 90 years old, I've already lived half my life. Time goes by so quickly, folks. And most don't count the cost of eternity. They only think about the present time, the present age, and do what's pleasurable unto them for a season. And we come out here and preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know, on Friday nights, we go down to Ebor, we go to Tampa, we go, to all, we go all over the place. We go to Mardi Gras, we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know, we hear it all the time as you guys are out just to ruin our fun. Doesn't God want us to have fun? Well, I have all kinds of fun as a Christian. I'm going to tell you that right now. What I find fun is walking in obedience to Christ, coming out here and lifting up my voice. And it's not something I do for accolades. It's not something I do for some great reward. But as the Bible speaks about, it calls us an unprofitable servant. We've only done what's required of us. That's all I'm doing tonight, folks, is what's required of me. I'm not trying to sound a trumpet before man. I'm not trying to get accolades. I'm not out here for your money. This is a free gospel message. I'm not even taking up an offering tonight. But you know, folks, we love you enough to care about you to come out here. Jesus said to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second greatest commandment. The first, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And that second greatest commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. I can't love my neighbor and let him go to hell. I can't love my neighbor and know that he's living a life of sin and he's on the highway to destruction, that broad way, without giving him a warning first. Now friends, we care about you, we love you, that's why we've come out here tonight. The love of God is available for you to receive. This gift of eternal life is available through the blood of Jesus Christ, folks. We're not out to ruin your fun because you can have a lot of fun as a Christian. I think what a lot of people mean is you're out here to stop me from having my pleasures. You're, 
you're here to stop me from, from doing what I want to do. I, I can't get drunk and I can't be joyful about it if you're out here preaching the gospel because it convicts me in my sin. Friends, we're not out here to bring conviction to you. That's the Holy Ghost job. And I'm not out here to condemn you because I'm not your judge. I'm out here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and I'm here to warn my neighbor because I love you. I love you. Matthew 5, 44, Jesus said this. He said, love your, he said, love your enemies. That's something different, isn't it? That's not what the world teaches. They teach to hate your enemies. But Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. Bless those that curse you. And pray for those which despitefully use you and persecute you. It's the kind of life Jesus has called me to. To love my enemies. And I wouldn't consider you my enemy. I would consider you my neighbor. How much more, if we're to love our enemies, how much more are we to love our neighbors? How much more are we to love our brethren? If we love Jesus, we'll keep his commandments. That's what he said in the book of John. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. My commandments are not grievous or my commandments are not burdensome. And his commandment was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why is it that we come out here to preach the gospel? Well, the Bible says that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It's foolishness. But unto us that are saved, it is the power of God. Power of God in, in, a, in a cross. Something so simple as a cross. A torture device. But you know, Jesus, he was hung upon that cross. He died at the death of a sinner. And he didn't deserve it. Jesus was without spot. He was blameless. And he died the death of a sinner. But he did it for you. And he said, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What does it mean, folks, to be heavy laden? It means you've got a great burden upon you. And that's exactly what sin does. Sin burdens you down and it weighs you down. It feels like it's crushing you. I know when I was a drunkard, Jesus Christ delivered me of that in 2015. But before I was delivered from that sin of drunkenness, I felt like that burden, that sin was just crushing me. I felt conviction from the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that when He comes, He will reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And that's exactly what the Holy Ghost does. He reproved me of that sin. And it felt like I was being crushed. It felt like, felt like I, was, I was dying inside. And I knew that if I died in my sin, that God would put me in hell where I belonged. And I couldn't argue that that's exactly where I deserve to be. It's where we all deserve to be, folks. We all deserve hell. Not a single one of us deserve eternal life with Jesus Christ. It's a gift and it's a beautiful gift that none of us deserve. You know, a lot of sin that we commit is sin that's in the flesh. I read about it in 1 Corinthians here. Folks, if you're listening over there in the parking lot, you can pull up your Bible app on your phone. If you have a Bible, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians 3. 16, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Did you know that? Did you know that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Speaking about believers there. God wants to give you a new spirit. He wants to cleanse your spirit, and He wants to put His Spirit within you. 
But he says, Know you not that you are the temple of God, the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple are ye? If any man would defile the temple of God, then God will destroy that man. Boy, those are terrifying words, folks. You know, there's a lot out there that believe that they're Christians. They profess to be Christians. It's kind of like the Bible says there that with their mouth they draw near to me. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That's, that's the way a lot are tonight in this world. They profess to be Christians, but yet they're engaged in sin. They'll entertain the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. A lot that go out and they get drunk on the weekends and show up to church on Sunday morning. I know that's hard to believe, but there are a lot of hypocrites out there. Defiling their bodies, a lot that profess to be Christians and they're smoking cigarettes. I don't know about you, but I, I've known quite a few people in my life that have died from smoking cigarettes. Several, several family members, at least five or six that I can think of, died of lung cancer, emphysema. From smoking cigarettes. And you know what the Bible says, that if you defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. You can't be a Christian child of God with God dwelling within you because you're a temple not made with human hands but it says that if you defile that temple then God will destroy you now, I don't know exactly what that means but it certainly seems that if you defile your temple if you destroy your body if you kill yourself whether it be through smoking cigarettes being an alcoholic and getting intoxicated because you know what that word intoxicated means it means you're putting toxins in your body and those toxins eventually can cause liver damage and they can kill a man real easy them cigarettes can cause emphysema and lung cancer and kill a man real easy. That's defiling that temple. And the Bible says here in 1 Corinthians that if any man defile that temple, that God will destroy him. To me, that sounds like God is going to put that person in hell. For having no respect for this gift that God has given us, this body, this life. We're to treat our body as a temple. We're to have respect over our body. And it goes on to say, let no man deceive himself. But we should certainly take word, take note of that, folks. When the Bible says, let no man deceive himself, anytime the Bible says not to be deceived, we should take very careful note because that means there's a deception that's going around. And here it says, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. And the thing about this passage, folks, is it says, let no man deceive himself. You know, you could be deceived from outside sources. Somebody can deceive you and that's bad. But the worst kind of deception is when you deceive yourself. And here the Bible says that let not man, let no man deceive himself. And this is the deception. So many people are deceiving themselves into thinking that they're wise in this world. And the Bible says, let him become a fool that he may be wise. You know what that takes? It takes some humility. Folks, when we think that we're wise, many folks think they're wiser than God. Many folks think they're wiser than the word of God. They don't need the Bible. They think they're wiser than God. They think that the Holy Spirit speaks through them or speaks to them. And oftentimes, even with those in the church, they believe that the Holy Spirit speaks to them. 
But it will contradict what it says in the Bible. A lot of people are even trying to discredit the Bible. This blessed King James Holy Bible. Saying that it's not the Word of God. That it's not inspired. That it's written by men. It sounds like the same things the atheists are saying. But it's going around in the church. There's that spiritual aspect that's going around that people think they're led by the Spirit and it contradicts what the Word of God says. Let me tell you folks, if you believe you're hearing from the Holy Spirit and it contradicts what the Bible says, you're not hearing from the Holy Spirit. You're hearing from the devil is what you're hearing from. God will never contradict His Word. The Holy Spirit will never contradict the Word of God. And this Bible, yet, although it was penned by man, 40 different authors, 66 different books. It was penned by man, but they were just vessels. As the Bible says, holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost is truly the author of this blessed King James Holy Bible. It's not written by man, it's only penned by man. You will not find one contradiction in this book, the Word of God. Don't be wise in your own sight. You must become a fool. Humble yourself, the Bible says. Lend your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. Friends, you need to humble yourself. God bless you, sir. You need to humble yourself in the sight of God. And how do you do that? You make yourself a fool. So that you might become wise when you come to that place of repentance folks as the bible says that godly sorrow worketh repentance not to be repented of what is repentance that's when you come to a place where you confess that you're a sinner to god that you really don't know as much as what you thought you knew god i have sinned against you i've sinned against my own body i deserve a devil's hell Lord, I, I can't save myself. I need you to save me. Lord, I'm stupid. I'm not wise like I thought I was. I can't get to heaven on my own accord. It's only by you, Lord. That's when you become a fool. Perhaps God will grant you a knowledge of the truth. He'll let you come to the knowledge of the truth. And as the Bible says, it's that fear of God that's the beginning of knowledge it says but fools despise wisdom and instruction don't be a fool in that aspect where you despise wisdom and instruction but fear God because it's the beginning of knowledge the Bible also says fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom So you must become a fool that you may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. I've met many atheists out on the street. And even many Christians are professing Christians that have a worldly wisdom about them. And they think they're so wise that they know so much. I've met many folks that profess themselves to be Christians, but they smoke marijuana. That's why I'm bringing these verses up tonight, folks. Because marijuana is defiling that temple of your body. And God says He will destroy you if you defile that temple. You can't be a Christian and get high. You can't be a Christian and get drunk. That's not a Christian, that's called a hypocrite. First John chapter 3 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. It's for this reason or for this cause that the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. It says, he that hath been born of God committeth not sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. That's the Christian, folks. He doesn't go on living a life of sin. He doesn't get drunk and say, I'm a Christian. 
He doesn't smoke cigarettes and say, I'm a believer in God. Because he knows that's defiled in his temple. As it says in 1 Corinthians 3. And we know that God will destroy any man that defiles the temple where the Holy Ghost dwells. But many think they know better than God. They think they're wise because they're wise in their own eyes. They're wise in, in, in the sight of the world. Now I know all the arguments. I preached against uh, the use of cannabis for quite some time. I was preaching many years ago in Nashville, Tennessee when they were trying to decriminalize marijuana, which eventually went through. But we were preaching downtown Nashville when they had a protest to legalize or decriminalize cannabis. At the time it was for medical marijuana. And now I'm certain that they're pushing for recreational use. That, see, that's how it begins. You give the devil a little foothold and he's gonna move in full force. And these folks were saying, well, you know, God created cannabis. And they would refer back to Genesis as you know, it, it's pretty bad when folks refer to God's word to try to justify their sin. That's how you know you've reached rock bottom. When you will try to use God's word to justify your sin. And these folks, they said that God created cannabis. And the Bible says that he's given you all these herbs. They're good for meat. Because they're wise in their own sight, folks. With a worldly wisdom, they think that they can justify their sin, they can be wiser than God, that they can find a loophole just like them Pharisees did. As Jesus said, beware of the Pharisees, uh, the leaven, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. It's exactly what they did. They were looking for loopholes. They were whitewashed sepulchers, it says, full of dead men's bones. They appeared to be clean on the outside, but inside they were full of dead men's bones. They were looking for loopholes in the law so that they could sin. And a lot that profess to be Christians today are no different. They're Pharisees, modern day Pharisees, that will look for loopholes that they can go on living in sin. And that leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, as Jesus said. But the Bible says that he has given us all the plants and they're good for meat. But it's exactly that. Good for meat. They're good to eat. The Bible doesn't say they're good to smoke. Many people, they want to use that to justify their smoking marijuana. But God give us lungs for one reason. It's to breathe air, to breathe oxygen, to oxygenate our blood so that we can live. He didn't give us lungs to, to huff smoke or vapors. It's those very things that destroy the lungs, that destroy the lining of the lungs that God has given us. Defile in that temple which God has given us, and He will destroy that man, the Bible says. As I said, the Bible says they're good for meat. Now, not every plant today is good for meat. You wouldn't eat poison ivy, just like you wouldn't smoke it. But you have to remember that this commandment was given to Adam when he was in the Garden of Eden. At that time, all the plants in the garden were good for meat. They weren't good to smoke. They were good for meat. You could eat of them. Because Adam was on a plant-based diet, there was no death in this world. It wasn't until Adam sinned that death came into this world. When God slaughtered an animal, because blood had to be shed to atone for Adam and Eve's sin. And he covered them with the skins of the animal. But there was no death in the world until that time. So they were on a plant-based diet. And they could eat any herb that was in the garden. And I'm sure they did. But you know, as a result of the fall of man, what did God do? He cursed the ground, folks. He cursed the ground. And man had to work the ground, till the soil, work and labor to grow his own food. And at that moment, not everything that sprung up from the ground was good for meat. Up from that cursed ground sprung many thorns and thistles and poison ivies and cannabis. 
things that are not good to eat, and they're not good for smoking either. But you see, many folks, they want to justify their sin by taking Scripture out of context. It says, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. They try to use the worldly wisdom to justify their sin. And it says, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Go ahead and be wise in your own sight. Try to justify your sin in the sight of God. He will take those that are wise in their own sight. He will take the wise in their own craftiness. It says, and again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. He knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they're vain. What's that vain mean? It means they're useless. Those that are wise in their own sight, those that are wise with the worldly wisdom, those thoughts are useless. They're vain. And that same man, I love it how that's used in context there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 with a man defiling his temple and God will destroy him. Why is it? Because many will defile their temple with their sin, the lust of the flesh, their drunkenness, their getting high. He says to flee fornication. That's a sin that you should flee from because it's a sin against your own body. Anyone that would unite their body, which is a temple, with a harlot. It's like uniting God together with a harlot. You're not a Christian if you're living in fornication. You're not a Christian if you're a drunk. You're not a Christian if you're getting high. There's no such thing, folks. Paul wrote once again in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 in the epistle to the church at Corinth. He said, Know ye not that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And here again, he says, Be not deceived. Just as he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians 3 was talking about deceiving your own self. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is talking about others that would deceive you with these lies. These lies are prevalent in today's society. Many people think that you don't have to live holy as a Christian. You don't, know, you don't have to live after holiness and righteousness and obedience to Christ. But Paul says, Know ye not that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a promise, folks. If you're living unrighteously, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. In 1 uh, John chapter 3, it says, Once again, be not deceived. And he that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he, as he is righteous. Talking about Christ. Folks, if you've been delivered from your sin, if you've been born again, Jesus Christ washed you clean of all your sin. He's made you a new creature in Christ Jesus. You know you can go back and you can defile yourself. You know you can go back to that sin. Jesus can wash you clean of it and you can go back to it. He says it's like a dog returning to its vomit. Or a swine or a hog to its mire, its filth. Don't judge me, he says. Preaching the gospel is not, don't judge me. And folks, many people will go back to their sin, go back to their filth, living in unrighteousness and unholiness. And there's a church, a uh, big, big portion of the church today that preaches what they call easy believism. One of these, one, two, three, repeat after me. Just repeat this sinner's prayer and you can be saved. No mention of repentance. No mention of living uh, in obedience to Christ. But you can go ahead and say this prayer. You can go back to your sin. You can go back to your sin, they think. And you can still have eternal life. That's not the way it works, folks. If you're living in sin, I, I would say that you've never been born again. You've never tasted of His heavenly gift. But be not deceived. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness 
of God in Him. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But once we've been washed clean of our sin and delivered from it, there comes a point that you must walk in righteousness. You must live in righteousness. As he said, be not deceived. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. And we're not saved by our own righteousness, but we're expected to do what Jesus has washed us clean of to stay out of. We don't go back to the filth. We don't go back to the vomit. And Paul said it there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He said, Know ye not that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, for neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, nor pornography. Porn hub on his windshield. Wicked. That's an adulterer right there, folks. Jesus said, if any man looketh upon a woman in lust, he's committed adultery with her already in his heart. Man had a porn hub sticker on his front window. Obviously, he's lusting after women. And he's an adulterer in the sight of God. And just as I said in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Paul said that no adulterer will inherit the kingdom of God. You can't be a Christian adulterer. You can't be a Christian drunk. You can't be a Christian and be in fornication, in immoral sex, sex outside of marriage, sex with someone that doesn't belong to you, that you're not married to. You can't be a Christian looking at pornography. You're not a Christian if you're engaged in pornography. You're an adulterer. But Paul went on to say this, and this is the good news. In verse 10, he says, As such were some of you. You know what that means? Paul was looking at the church at Corinth, and he was saying, You were a drunkard. You were a thief. You were a homosexual and an adulterer. As such were some of you. But, but, here's the but, ye are washed it doesn't say you were washed it says you are that's a present tense thing we're washed presently we are washed we are justified we're sanctified he said ye are washed you're justified you're sanctified by the spirit of our God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ washed sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. God bless you, sister. So folks, that is the good news. You could be a drunkard right now. Maybe you're a drunkard that professes to be a Christian. As Jesus was talking about those that would profess Him with their mouth, honor Him with their lips, and their heart is far from Him. Not walking in obedience but lasciviousness thinking that the grace of God is something that just covers over your sin and you can go on living a life of sin and filth and wickedness let me tell you if you're living in that type of life today you're not a Christian you're only fooling yourself but the good news is just as Paul said that you can be washed you can be sanctified and justified by the spirit of our God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ won't you be washed today in the blood of Jesus Christ the very one who can wash you clean from your sin and your filth. And won't you walk in obedience to Him in righteousness? There's no reason, no cause for you to give in the temptation. And I'm going to finish it up and wrap it up with this, folks. So my brother can get up here and preach. As we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Well, 1 Corinthians just got all kinds of good nuggets in it. You know, Corinth was a wicked, wicked city. They used to say back during that time, during biblical times, can anything good come out of Corinth? I'm sure that many saying that about Sefner and Mango. Can anything good come out of Sefner and Mango? I've heard Sefner called Methner. 
because there's a lot of meth and drugs and wickedness that's going on but can anything good come out of scepter i'm telling you if you would latch on to this gospel message and if you would cry out to jesus christ then there's something good that can come out of scepter first corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 says there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man but god is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. You see, folks, it's, it's very common to be tempted. There's no temptation that has taken you, but such as is common to man. These temptations are common. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's not a sin. I, I'll stand out here and be transparent with you. Uh, I'm tempted from time to time. Probably daily tempted. That's why Jesus said, if any man would come after me, he must first deny himself. Deny himself. Deny that flesh. Put that stuff behind you. Deny the temptations. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. And what is that? The cross of suffering. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow him. I'm tempted daily. But you know what? I don't have to give in to that temptation. Tempted, yet without sin. The Bible says that he was tempted in every way, yet without sin. Many Christians think that just because you're tempted, you're living in sin. It's not true, folks. Jesus was tempted. We see three right there after he was baptized in the Jordan, that he was led to the wilderness where he fasted for 40 days and he was tempted by the devil. He was tempted, but without sin. How did Jesus overcome that temptation? I'm sure he spent lots of time in prayer. And he was the living epistle. But every time that Satan would tempt him, he would come back with, it is written. God has given us a way of escape. Folks, when you're tempted, you withdraw yourself to your prayer closet. And you read the Bible. You know its promises. When you're afflicted with a certain temptation over and over again, you find out the promises that apply to that. And you come at the devil... And you come at the flesh with what is written in the blessed King James Holy Bible. It is written. And the Bible says that he will not suffer you to be attempted above that which you're able. That means he will not allow you to be tempted beyond the point that you're not able to stand. You're not able to uh, reject that temptation. That you're not able to turn from it. And he's given you a way of escape. That you might be able to bear it. What's that mean? That you might be able to bear the temptation and that you might not give in to sin. People think it's impossible not to sin. You know what? If it was impossible not to sin, Jesus wouldn't have told the lady to go and sin no more. Read about that in the book of John, chapter 8. Jesus told the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. He said, go and sin no more. He told the blind man, I believe he was blind, Regardless, Jesus told the man in John chapter 5, I believe he was lame, took up his bed, walked. He said, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Jesus wouldn't tell anybody not to sin anymore if it weren't possible. He'll cleanse you of your sin. He'll cleanse you of unrighteousness. And he wants you to walk in holiness and righteousness and obedience to him. He made it real simple, folks, just two commandments. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. Real simple, folks. Walk in obedience to Christ. God bless you. He wouldn't have told you not to sin if it were not possible. He's given you the tools to equip you. You can read about it in Ephesians chapter 6 about putting on the armor of God that you might be able to stand. The problem is, is most Christians or professing Christians today, they're not armored up. They don't even think about putting on the armor. They just yield to the temptation whenever it comes. It's what's the easiest thing, just to yield to it, right, brother? They'll just yield to that temptation and give in to it. But the Bible says to be peaceful, live peaceably with all men. Follow after peace with all men and, and, and holiness 
without which no man shall see the Lord. The Bible says if you're not living holy, if you're not holy, you will not see the Lord. And you can only be made holy through Jesus Christ. And walking in obedience to Him. But you don't do it on your own. You don't do it on your own. He sent you comforter. He sent you one that would stand, that would fill you and lead you and guide you into all truth. One that would equip you with the full armor of God that you might be able to stand. All folks, turn and repent. Put your faith and trust in Jesus. Cry out to Him. He will save you. He'll wash you clean. He will give you the gift of His Holy Spirit. As the Bible says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the most precious gift, that He will fill you with this Holy Ghost. And you're never alone. Your body becomes a temple where the Holy Ghost dwells. And He will lead you and guide you into all truth through His Scripture. The very one that authored this Bible. He will lead you into the truth. He will give you truth, the knowledge of the truth. He will give you wisdom. He will give you instruction. He will take you by the hand and He will cause you to stand, friends. He will lead you along the way. And ensure that you can stand when you're faced with that temptation. Try out to Him today and be saved in the name of Jesus. I will ever be true 
its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory Someday for a crown.